All right. I first met Callie when she was an undergraduate, I believe. The past five years have felt more like 30, so some things are a blur. I remember she presented herself as an unusually competent, thoughtful, and talented student. Nothing against my other students. I appreciate you all. Sometimes I worry though that I can't see the future. And Callie's looked almost blindingly bright and warm. She was one of those students whose features never had any shade, just sun and grief. And I imagine she could have been anything in this world, from an oncologist to the dean of the arts and humanities. I could see her navigating spreadsheets in a boardroom with ease because of her disciplined and calculated mind. The kind of stories are just as organized with a youthful lightness and heart. So I worry that we writers live in worlds too dim for someone uh, like Callie. And why would she want to live under the heavy clouds of literary existence? Then she began writing her graduate thesis. But in the manuscript, we are taken into a world of gods and super warriors that battle and using the elements. They battle for glory, for honor, for vanity. The novel is led by two young women who are indeed potential super warriors. One is powerful, beautiful, unquestionably talented, and destined for greatness, while the other is broody and self-conscious with a power that is menacing and uncontrollable. The novel is rich in that there is a reversal of illumination of darkness and darkness, like a rim of shadow around a golden door of light. And that's where Callie's imagination comes with meaning and life, and why I understand her choice to live among us writers and our backwards guys. So let us enter the world of fire, wind, earth, and shadows as we welcome. Can I come up? Thank you, Mia. That was, I think, the best introduction that I've ever had. Um, it was very touching. Um, thank you all for being here. So my Thesis is a novel, um, the first in a series, I'm hoping, and I prepared a little surprise, um, something that my, my friends don't know about. Um, I am also an artist, and so I mocked up a little like cover of what my thesis would look like. My thesis novel is called Sure Fire. Thank you. Before I get into it, I would like to um, acknowledge the people who have helped me along this journey. Thank you, Vanita, for being my thesis chair, my mentor since undergrad. You provided me with so many opportunities and taught me so many techniques to strengthen my writing. Thank you, Stephen and Tanya, for serving on my committee and providing feedback on my thesis, as well as being awesome professors. Thank you to the MFA faculty who have made the past three years the most enjoyable of my entire academic experience. Thank you, Jefferson and the English department staff for all you do behind the scenes. Thank you to the folks at the Graduate Student Success Center for helping me develop good writing, writing habits and making me stick to the timelines I set. Thank you, mom and dad, for your support. Dad, you told me that if I wanted to be a writer, I had to be successful, and so I'm trying really hard to do that. <laughs> mom, the first time I told you to follow my thesis, we were out chilling by the pool. You were amazed you asked me how I came up with the idea for this story. Um, I still don't know, but you, your excitement just told me a lot. And it really made me feel like you cared. Thank you, Quinn, my best and only brother, for always helping me see the bigger picture. Thank you, Sarah, for being Surefire's number one fan and sounding board. And my sounding board on this story. And thank you to my friends and everyone who's shown me support along this journey. Surefire wouldn't be what it is without you. So a little bit of context because I cannot read um, like 100 pages in 20 minutes. So I'm gonna be reading an excerpt from a little further in. Um, as Benita said, this is a um, young adult or YA fantasy novel set in a world where elemental powers are the norm and fighting with fire and lightning is a commercialized sport. The plot revolves around the friendship between two girls, Rory, who's there in the center, and then Orla, who's all shiny up above. Orla is a winged elemental who is a prodigy at controlling her element, while Rory is what would best be described as a fire hazard. So I'll be reading from the third chapter. 
a uh, quick synopsis of the story so far. Rory and Orla are about to graduate from a prestigious high school that specializes in teaching students the sport of battling. Uh, Rory attends Orla's showcase match with her mutual friend Sterling. Orla completely smokes out the competition. Rory becomes kind of envious. Her uh, inferiority complex starts coming out and she lies to Orla about not being able to go celebrate her victory with her because she doesn't want to be around her. Now we're going to start when Rory is on her way home to have dinner with her family. Skygilt City passed by Rory in a blur as the lightning rails zip down through the hills, moving away from the city center. Skyscrapers gave way to intercity parks, their tall trunks curling around walking paths and ponds. A scooter path snaked along the train tracks for a while before vanishing into a grove. Houses dotted the slopes with the crest of shrines peering out from the peaks, surrounded by white leaf trees. The train clumped and shuddered along the turns. Rory clutched the handle above her head, letting her weight sway. The fireproof coach was abnormally full today, filled with young families and a smattering of older children. No one her age. She pulled at the cuff of her shirt, wishing she had a way to hide her face. It was embarrassing that she still had to ride in the fire hazard cart at her age. One wailing cry rose above the noise. A toddler, fiery tears streaming from his eyes. His affinity must have been newly presented. He looked rather young to have one. Every so often, a drop fell from his nose and sizzled on the heat-proof floor below. I don't want to be fire, he cried, while his parents tried to shut him. The father gripped his son's arm. Be grateful for what you have, he said. His gaze met Rory's. There was an envy in his eyes, a longing. Rory looked away, a stab of pity, wriggling its way between her ribs, for whom she wasn't sure. When the train pulled into her station, she was quick to depart, darting through the turnstiles at a speed that had several other train goers muttering under their breath. She took up a jog, her bag, her bag thudding against her leg. Her house wasn't far from the station, a small two-story red brick building with ivy completely coating the front wall and her mom's army of succulents along the porch. Inside, her family was going about their evening routine. Her mom, Perla, stood in front of the stove, humming under her breath while she tapped out a beat on the counter using a container of salt. Her dark skin had a warm blush from the heat of the room, her black hair speckled with gray strands, pulled into a short ponytail at the nape of her neck. Welcome back, she said as Rory shut the door. She was shorter than Rory, who was already short enough, and had to stretch stretched to kiss Rory's temple. She patted Rory's cheek affectionately. Through the window, or through the kitchen window, the sky was turning brilliant pinks and purples, casting rainbows against the glass. Rory sat down at the dining table. The loud hum of the television filtered in from the next room, just barely audible over the sound of her dad and granddad arguing. The sky gilt's mites don't stand a chance in the regionals. Maury said. And you think your team is any better? Granddad Clarence said. The smites are outdated, Maury said again, louder, as if he could drown him out. Maury peeked at the screen and saw the sports channel logo in the corner. How unsurprising. Her dad and her granddad's entire relationship was founded on the, their mutual obsession over the professional league circuit. More bets had been exchanged between their hands than in any other place on the continent. Whenever a match was playing, they became impervious to everything else. She doubted they even noticed she was home. Granddad Clarence tapped his shoes against the wood floor instead of replying. He fell into the habit whenever he didn't know what to say, shutting his eyes and squeezing his bushy brows together. The sound was sharp and spoke his dissent for him. That wasn't the reason he wore shoes around the house. He dressed even when he didn't intend to go out, wearing nice button downs and tucking the ends into his trousers, a hangover from his time as a businessman. Meanwhile, Mari wore a bright red number nine Firebirds jersey and shorts. He loved to work out, though his free time was so limited as to be non existent. 
and what was left was monopolized by league matches. They haven't seen a good battler in years, Maury said. They should have disbanded when the original members retired, like, like all real teams do. On screen, 10 or 12 people, all wearing the same black uniform, stood on a conference stage. Their black bodysuits offset the reflective sheen of their protective gear, as glossy as a mirror, while their arm and leg guards shimmered under the stage lights, revealing shiny metallic thunderbolts every time they moved. One man smiled and waved at the crowd off screen, his muscular arms almost comical, paired with his skinny body. Another, a woman, whose calves looked like lightning bolts, propped on metallic platform boots, summoned an arc of lightning between her excuse me, between her palms, bounced get back and forth like a slinky. There was a brief flash of cameras. Someone cheered. Orla's radiant smile came to mind, a whole crowd of spectators roaring her name. Rory frowned. I didn't expect you home so soon, Perla said. How would the showcase go? Orla won. Oh, good! Perla lifted the pan off the stove and placed it on a pot holder in the, in the center of the table. Rory leaned back, drawing her arms away from the heat emanating from the pot. Her skin prickled. It's not like anyone expected her not to, she felt compelled to say. Perla scrutinized her. Boys, she said, still eyeing Rory. Dinner's ready. The conversation between the two men petered off, replaced with the groans of their chairs and granddad Clarence's joints. Perla crossed her arms. Is this about your fire again? Rory traced the grooves in the wooden table. No. We talked about this before. Mom, really, it's nothing. Rory made a big show of picking at her nails. Her fluorescent red nail polish was starting to chip, revealing the ash and grit lining her nail beds, which she could never seem to get rid of. She'd need to redo them. Hmm. Perla came up behind Rory sweeping the dark baby hairs from the back of her neck. Her finger lingered on a burnt patch near Rory's ear. This is healing fast. Well, it's been a week. Rory delicately touched the spot with her bandaged finger. That was from her most recent training session with her tutor, for sale. Her parents had paid a hefty sum of their savings to enroll her in a private training facility for her 10th birthday. The rest had gone towards the academy's tuition, a risk that placed their finances in peril, and half the reason so much wrote on her showcase. If she didn't secure a career in battling after all that investment, she didn't know what her family would do. Yeah, yeah then, she had been pushing herself to her remnants. Last week was just one example. Rosea had tasked her with lighting a target on fire, which she did, in fact, accomplish. In fact, she lit three on fire at once, and Rosea was good. After the tiny projectile flame she intended to conjure came out more like a firework. Only her fingers remained tipped in flame afterward, and when she went to brush them behind her ear, well, Mari entered the kitchen. Hey, Spitfire, he said upon seeing Rory. He gripped her shoulders from behind, giving them a shake. He faked a little shriek, poking at her neck with his fingers like he was a firebird. There's There's my little battler battler in the making. Just a couple days until you're like them, huh? On TV, a security guard approached the team on stage, yelling and jabbing a finger at the woman playing with lightning. The woman only shrugged, undaunted, and the lightning disappeared following a tap to the conductor at her hip. (laughs) Well, don't be them, Maury said. Just like them. Mercy of Ari, Perla exclaimed. Using your powers willy-nilly like that, that's how someone gets electrocuted. I swear, Ari, people take their powers for granted these days. Rory winced. Whenever her mom was trying to make a point, she pulled out her nickname for Rory, Ari. It was another way to shorten her full name, Aurora. Her mom had chosen the nickname because of its similarity to the name of the sky god, King Ari, as if invoking the spirit of the god could bring Rory of all her bad habits. Rory used to like it as a kid, being connected to the gods in a way that others weren't, 
A buzzy warmth would spread through her chest whenever she heard it, because only her mom used it. It was their special thing. But somewhere along the way, Ari became synonymous with scoldings and disappointment. Now, Rory preferred Rory. Perla continued. You have to promise that when you become a big shot like that, you set a good example. Rory rolled her eyes. Yeah. yeah, because I'll ever be a big shot. Ari, Perla warned. Give the girl a rest, Perla, Granddad Clarence said. She's already heard a lifetime of your yammering. You can stay out of how I raise my daughter, Dad. Ari, Perla turned back to her. You've got an affinity. A lot of people don't. You're going to use it. Roy's ears burned. Easy for you to say. Oh, what was that? I'm not hungry, Roy said, slipping off her chair. Mm-mm, you stay right there. Roy froze with one foot on the little rolling floor. You're not going to walk away from this conversation. Roy looked to her dad and granddad for help. I know how you get, Perla continued. You get all caught up in your head, comparing yourself to others. It's holding you back. If battling is really something you want to do, you have to take this seriously. Roy slumped in her chair. Mom, can we not do this right now? This is your whole future, Perla emphasized. Everything is riding on it. You think we invested so much into your tutors and schooling for fun? No. We've done our part, now you need to do the rest. You have to put in the effort. Oh, effort. Rory wanted to scoff. She squeezed her fork until the metal pressed deep into her skin. Sometimes she wondered why she was doing this, and if it was really her own dream she was chasing. Rory had always been compared to her mom. They had the same dark hair, the same gleaming brown eyes, the same quick temper. Was it a stretch to think that her mom might see her younger self when she looked at Rory? Rory loved battling, loved the feeling of her fist making contact with her target. That first spark of heat against her fingers in the second before it imploded. But every time Perla opened her mouth, she loved it a little less. And she hated that it was her mom who had caused those feelings to sprout within her. Perla made it sound so simple. Just try a little harder and everything will work out. It wasn't as though Rory didn't stay after classes most weekdays, practicing with Orla and Sterling. It wasn't as though she didn't attend tutoring sessions late into the night. Rory knew just how impactful elemental affinities were, how those who possessed them had the upper hand in society, especially now that more and more people were being born without them. Sure, she could put her flames to use as a welder or to control forest fires, or any other number of essential but menial jobs. But that way, that was something different, something old, something ancient, something that arose millennia ago when the sibling gods gifted the elements to mankind. Professional battling as it existed today was but a remnant of what came before, the ritual dances and clashing of elements before the seats of the gods. Rory felt a stirring whenever she stood on the battlefield, like she was tapping into that age-old practice. It gave her a sense of purpose, of belonging. Listen, kid, Granddad Clarence cut in. You go out there and do your best, you hear? Not everyone's gotta be some whiz who can crack a flame. Your, your Grammy Ruby never used her flames for anything besides sending stray strands off her clothes. Oh. Don't bring mom into this, dad, Perla said. Rory knew where this was going. Now for the first time, she wished she'd been born with an affinity for shadow so she could melt into the table's shade and never reappear. Your mama wouldn't agree with how you're pushing Rory, Granddad Clarence said. Just because you don't have an affinity. Just because I don't have an affinity, Perla said. This isn't about me, this is about Ari. She has potential, and let me remind you, you don't have an affinity either. He shook his head. Elements aren't everything. They may as well be, for her was snapped. Mom could have used hers for so much more, but she didn't. She wasted them. 
Oh, I thank the God she's not around to hear you say those words, words he said. said. Well, it's true, she said. Oh, would we know? A single sharp laugh punctuated the question. We're all shells. Ray stared down at her plate. Her face was uncomfortably warm. Honey, Mari said, putting his hand on Perla's arm. Let's talk about something else. Perla slammed her knife on the table. The plates rattled. Rory has potential, she said again. And I don't want her to waste it because she's not trying hard enough. Before, Rory had lied about not feeling hungry. Now, an emptiness filled her, a gnawing ache simmering beneath the surface. A dinner in silence. <laughs>